Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Yvette Campbell, pastor of Rolling Hills Moravian. I also serve on the board of Cooperative Ministry. We're thrilled with the response to our first virtual leadership focus conference. Over 130 Moravians from at least 62 different churches and or agencies have registered from three provinces, Northern, Southern, and Eastern West Indies. It is not too late to tell friends and ministry colleagues to register by visiting moravianbcm.org the as the conference runs through March 13. We are especially glad that this year's conference is an interprovincial event co-hosted by the Board of Cooperative Ministry Southern Province and the Alfia Congregation Task Force of the Northern Province. You are all currently muted, but will have an opportunity to share soon. If you have got comments or questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Our presenters this evening lead worship in the Moravian Church quite often. They are Pastor John Wallace of the Dover First Moravian Church of Ohio and Joe Capton, a lay worship leader of the Fries Valley, Urichville and Naden Hutton Moravian Shared Ministry Program of Ohio. John has been Joe's pastor for the last 12 years, and Joe has been John's creative thespian, director, friend, and collaborator for just as long. Together, these two friends travelers would like to lead you in a delightful and helpful conversation about arts of worship, Plesha. So without further ado, I now turn over to none other than Pastor John Wallace. Good evening, sisters and brothers. Nice to have you here tonight. You're here in Ohio, wherever you might be, we are glad that we can connect through this kind of technology and opportunity. So we're gonna just spend some time talking about worship and in inspiring and how we can take two things, the arts and worship, and somehow merge them together, weld them together. So scribble your notes along and take notes as you need to or put them in the chat box if you need to as well and we will look at those questions towards the end. So my goal here and Joe's as well is to help you just gather some more ideas in your box, opportunities, ways of approaching worship and celebrating life together. So just a little bit about me. Um, technically, I am a Moravian from my birth, so I, I've never been nothing but a Moravian Christian ever since I was born. I'm a cheesehead, so that makes me a Wisconsinite, uh, raised in a small town. Yes, our family had a dairy farm, and yes, I was a little stinker running around in a dairy farm, and milked cows and all those kinds of things as a punk. But I never lived on the farm because my mother, as soon as she had the opportunity to move to the big town of Lake Mills, she took that chance and went. I graduated from high school, thank goodness, and then I went on to college. I have a degree from the University of Wisconsin at Platteville, one of the minor colleges in the major system of Wisconsin. And I jokingly um, refer to it as I graduated with a major in social studies comprehension without a teaching degree. So what does that mean? That means I already had this call in my heart and I knew I was gonna go on to seminary. So I didn't finish the teaching aspect of being a social studies teacher. So that makes me someone who I am good at a party for about 15 minutes at anything you want to talk about. And then about 15 minutes 
that's about as long as I can last before I run out of things I can say or profound moments to pontificate upon, and then I move on to another little group. That's what a social studies major will do for you. I have three adult children, graduated from the seminary, been married for 38 years to a wonderful wife. Um, this is my fifth stop along the call route. I have served eight different churches in all kinds of settings, from rural to tiny country to large, large metropolitan areas and suburbs. And now we are here in um, a small city in rural Ohio and just absolutely love it. We've been here 12 years and I turn it over to my colleague, Brother Joe. Uh, hello, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Very good. Uh, so uh, my name is Joe Compton and I am born and raised Moravian for the past 24 years of my life. I've attended Dover First Moravian Church all of those years and uh, very proud to be a Moravian. I graduated from this area from Dover High School and then went on to the Ohio State University and studied theater and education and uh, did a little stint working at Disney for some time. Uh, but in, uh, in between those experiences, I did a tri-ministry for a summer uh, with our six local Moravian churches and have since uh, started a uh, stint with the uh, three of our local churches doing a shared uh, ministry program where I lay preach about once or twice every three or six to 12 weeks within those congregations. And so that's currently my experience right now, participating within the church as both a member and a worship leader. And uh, I hope tonight that what Pastor John and I have put together for you will be inspiring and we look forward to sharing with you guys. Do I do this one too? You're good. Okay. Thank you, Joe. So since you've logged on to listen to us and you want to talk about worship, we're going to have a touch of worship now. And what I'd like you to do is to join us in this worship experience and use and think of this as a pattern or an example of something that could be done. Now, when we're done with the worship service, we'll reflect a little bit about it, and then um, we'll give you some more um, nuts and bolts kinds of things and angles, pieces that you can use in your own help and your own ability as team leaders in your church. For my guess is you're one of the sous chefs, a part of your congregation. You might not be the head cook, but you are certainly well involved and invested where you Hang your hat for God. So let's have a touch of worship tonight. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Psalm 2510. We're going to go down this road and see what the Lord has in store for us. Who are we going to walk with? Who are we going to meet? Well, I want us to meet a character out of the Old Testament. His name is Enoch. He doesn't get a lot of... Um, splash in the Bible. He only shows up three different times. I want you to see a passage. I'd like you to read it first to yourself. Now, even though we're socially distanced, let's read it together without um, unmuting ourselves, but just read it together. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Each walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Genesis chapter 5, 21 through 24. Do you realize that it's only three different splashes, pin drops, if you will, where Enoch's name shows up? 
And this is where it is truly talked about, is in the passage from Genesis. In passing, you would see it, his name show up in Hebrews and Jude. This is where the meat and the potatoes are, so to speak, for the story. So what I want us to kind of concentrate on in our time of worship tonight is each of these references add certain distinctive aspects to this man from this very basic biblical history, the primitive legend and lore of Enoch, if you will. But tonight we focus on Genesis chapter 5, a description that directly talks about him. Now, if you read the accounts closely, it appears to me that, like most of us, Enoch too had his own rebellious time. When Enoch lived for 65 years, 65 years, wow, that's a long time. If you're a third grader, you wouldn't even think of that as a possibility. 65, my goodness. Kind of like most of us, if you think about it even more. We all have those years in life where we're far from God. And I think Enoch in those first 65 tended to be that rebel without a cause out and about doing his own thing. So in this section, you could say, well, Pastor John, the timeline is thin. The storyline is pretty thin. But as a speaker, we could embellish upon it and thicken it out if we wanted to. The part I think we need to concentrate on is on the second line. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah, 300 years, and had other sons and daughters. Things changed when his son came into the world. He walked with God then because, well, don't we all wanna walk in that garden with God as well? So you're in worship. We want to walk with God. I think that's a goal we all have. We've probably all had those moments when we wondered, do you think the shoes are going to fit? Do we think that our walk with God will be sufficient enough, good enough? So I was wondering, how big are your feet? Do these uh, shoes look like they'd fit? Do you see a pair you want to really own? I really kind of like the ones down on the right with the big toes and the red. They look kind of nice. I think if I wanted to do the Ronald McDonald house visit, I think I'd have a pair of those. So I wonder how many steps have you taken today? Maybe you need to check your phone or your app or your device on your wrist and find out how much walking have I done recently? Now, I know some of us, we kind of get that little, that little touch of, whoa, you know? I put in X amount of steps today. So I looked before I checked here, I've only put a thousand steps in today, so I haven't done very well. But I bet you've done better. So when I look at worship and I think of this time together, 
celebrating our walk with the Lord, sometimes we have to realize we know that walking is part of life. And like Enoch, we wanted to join with God. And when we join with God, it's better than trying to walk your own way and do it your own routine. And it might sound a little bit like this. And that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. You go and sit right down and cry. What you gonna do when I see my body? All you gonna do is dry your while I'm walking. Here's the deal. So back to the shoes, back to your stride and your walk with God. Is it vigorous or calm? Do you walk with a swagger to your step or a waddle? Is it brisk or a saunter? Do you march when you walk with God? Did you ever wonder what happened with Enoch before he met God? How his walk might have looked? Did he walk like an Egyptian? We don't know. But in the midst of our world, I wonder how many steps Enoch took on his own terms before something happened in his life. And that's when Methuselah came along. Well, it doesn't have to be a student. It doesn't have to be a child. It could be something else in a person's journey that suddenly this idea of walking my own way and now I want to return back and walk with God is what makes it very, very clear. Because this verse in scripture is pristine. It tells us that in life, without God, with all our comforts and civilization, all our discoveries, all our songs, I wrote, think that we want can to sing it together. The for mechanics and the technology, what's the deal? Be We're all happy. just trying to be happy. That's what Enoch in thought. Every life we have some and along trouble. came Methuselah. When you worry, and you realized it up, maybe don't worry. my life isn't as full as I thought Be it happy. was. Don't worry. So instead of filling it up with stuff, he started filling it up with the Lord. And that, brothers and sisters, made all the difference for those next 300 years. Now, you can split hairs over how long Methuselah lived or or Enoch lived, but I'm not here to ponder that. I'm here to tell us the story is simple. The first 65 were the lost years. The last 300 were the best. And isn't that what it is in our faith walk? As soon as we let Christ into our lives, things change. They don't become perfect, but they change. They change for the better. Methuselah's name, it means javelin thrower. So imagine that for a second. And then imagine in your own life, what was the one or two things that opened your heart to God, that burst that open so that you said, Lord, you're right. I've been going the wrong way. I've been doing my own thing. 
I've been walking like an Egyptian. I've been walking this way. It's now time to change and walk with you because my feet are weary. My shoulders are tired. My legs are tired. And I need to press on with you. And suddenly we get a new spring in our step as we slip those sandals on and move with our Lord. We discover how to walk as we were intended, just like Enoch. It took him a while to figure it out, but it got to last a lot longer for the time that he could walk with God. Discovering some ways we can forge, I hope, in these precious times we spend together as a little community on Zoom to forge the arts and see how worship can work hand in hand, step by step, stride by stride. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for these sisters and brothers that have gathered here tonight. We thank you for this time to worship and realize that you are the focus of our journey. And you have called each one of us to do what needs to be done in the journey before us. Thank you for walking with us, for waiting for us when we were off doing our own thing. And you were there when we turned around and said, it's time to come back. It's time to find you. It's time to walk forward. For this we give thanks for this night together. Amen. During this Lenten season, we are often reminded that we all have a cross to bear, something to carry. And when I looked at this particular art print at the close of this worship service, I thought to myself, the faces. There's no faces on these people walking with their crosses. That's because they represent who we are. All the races, ages, and opportunities as we walk with the Lord tonight. So that's our worship, just to give you a little taste of what one could do in your opportunities that come before you. So with that in mind, we're gonna just sort of jump into the, um, the core of this piece. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to kind of, you know, loosen up a little bit, readjust, you know, roll those shoulders, uh, go into some kind of mode and focus, and, and here we go. I want inside of you that little artist to come to life. Wake them up, shake them up, and I want that little artist to start making a storyboard. The storyboard goes like this. Let that artist start painting. Here it is. The dishes are all done. You have had a wonderful meal. It was a five course meal. You have digested it well. There was the salmon and the salad and the potatoes that were just right in. Oh, the dessert was to die for. And that your, your significant other did this all for you as a complete surprise. And now that person guides you to your favorite chair. You put a comforter over your lap. You slip on the slippers of choice, a cup of whatever you'd like to drink, and in hand you have your book or your phone or the remote, thumb warmed up because it's your storyboard. You can make it any way you want. And then you enjoy what you want. And for the next hour or so, it is very good. And then what you realize is that pretty soon you start getting this, this craving. You start to crave, the, the salad's gone, the salmon is burned up and pretty soon you're realizing, maybe I should have joined that noom factor moment in that commercial, but I don't I'm a hunter and gatherer and I can snack when I want because the refrigerator's there and it knows me and it calls me by name and you can feel the crave come back. And suddenly you find yourself wandering into the kitchen 
And there it is. You, my friend, have to eat. You have to eat, John. Yeah, we all do. But there's something else that happens when we do this that I think is absolutely incredible when we are asked to be worship leaders or help lead worship services for the Lord. Because every Sunday, Wednesday, or whenever you meet, we're called to do that. And that means we gather, if you will, every week, a recipe book of the Word of God. We ponder the ingredients. We check the fridge of our mind, the spice rack of our heart. We pull out the pots and pans. We turn it into a production because we are going to create a meal once a week, every week, every time we do this to those that we want to gather at the table of grace. And we are going to feed them and give them some nourishment, spiritual nurture and strength. That's what worship people do. And that's what you do. It's more than a snack. It is the feast of the Lord. From an unpublished book by Will Harstein, he writes, Worship is the kind of faith experience and spiritual enrichment we all crave. Worship is the kind of faith experience and spiritual encouragement that we all crave. I believe in corporate worship, getting together. It has been difficult, as we all know, during the pandemic. And Zoom has helped fill in that gap, but it's, it's not quite the same, but it's better, brothers and sisters, than nothing. What I've learned over the years from my experience of being a pastor for 37 years is you go back and you think of those morsels, those kernels of wisdom that others shared with you. I'd like to share two. When I was a young pastor, basically not much older than Joe. In my first parish, I was 25 years old. The bishop at hand taught me this lesson. He said, John, remember this. Worship is the one time in the week when you can reach the most people in one movement and make an influence. Prepare well for worship. And that has stuck with me for my entire call. Worship is important. Getting the family of God gathered around the table of grace is an essential. Now, the second has a different color altogether to it. This is when I was a student pastor. I was a, I was a senior at the seminary in Moravian and thought, well, I already know all this stuff and I just can't wait to get my first church. But this senior pastor quipped to me at his home. Most church people really want three things out of us, the pastor, marry their daughter, baptize their grandson, and bury their mother. Whatever you do, don't mess up those moments of ministry. Now, it may sound a little crass, and you may be a little put off by that, but in reality, it's part of the truth. Because many times, we're the hired, seen as the hired hand, the hired jester, the hired cook for the time that we're there. Now, these two brothers are long gone. They're home with the Lord, and I miss them in the ways that they would ladle out, if you will, spoon out wonderful wisdom and things to hold on to. But over the years, they have taught me something that I have kind of gravitated to quite often when I prepare for worship. For me, worship is about being a chef. You are the worship chef for the congregation entrusted to your care. You are going to cook something up for your congregants, the patrons in the pew, if you will. The God and the word and the sacrament combined together with that fellowship and ministry. That's what we strive to do. This is no hell's kitchen a la Gordon Ramsay. I'm not smashing and throwing anything. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the fishes and loaves. And there are always 
opportunities for us to grow. Check out this. Fingers be home, diddy hoon, good as a do. Ye burst beer, horn beer, steer, bork, bork, bork. English beer, the Swedish meatball. It's beer, the sauce, the meatball. It's beer, the beer. Ye be do, a sport the root. It's the root. Ye be do, it's the root of the root. It's a beansy bouncy burger, eh? And serve the burger, come soon. It's beer, and you be who? It's beer. Even you who? Fifteen love. And maybe, just maybe, the congregates in the balcony are like some of the brothers and sisters we have in the churches that we so wonderfully serve. Why do I show this image? Because of Will Harstein, my professor, my preaching pastor who wrote, worship is the main reason for coming together as believers. And it is the most likely instrument for keeping us together as God's covenant people. Second, I believe that corporate worship needs to be rendered well and done with attention, given to all aspects of worship that over the centuries have provided sustenance to believers whenever and wherever they have gathered. I turn it over to Joe. Can everyone hear me all right? Wonderful. All right. So in this statement from Will Harstein, he reminds us that in whatever form you are receiving worship, whether it be from a piano or an organ, contemporary music, traditional music, the King James Bible or the NIV or the Message Bible, through liturgy or no liturgy at all, through a, a dance or a ballet, whatever you are being presented in worship, as long as the main goal continues to keep praising thanking and glorifying God, you're keeping that at the center of your heart and what you present, there's really no end to what you can provide to, uh, to your congregation. That is what is important. important. If you keep your sights on worshiping God, all you need is a spark of an idea and some creativity, and you as the worship leader or lay pastor or whoever, or whatever role you play, um, can find inspiration wherever you look. Now, worship is a time that we spend together honoring God, but sometimes we become a little too accustomed to that tradition and fall victim to the routine, showing up to church each Sunday or just logging on to YouTube or however you're getting your worship experience these days. And when this happens, there's a lot of potential to lose energy, and that allows worship to kind of fall and become more of a chore each week, going because we feel we have to, but not going because we want to. Adding art, some sort of spice here and there, something special uh, re rejuvenates that, that want to come to worship and turns it from being a chore, but turns it into something that we love to do each week. Now, we're gathered here tonight because you might be curious about the opportunity that Pastor John and I are presenting this evening. And hopefully, through uh, some of our points that we're going to make here in the next few minutes or so, you become inspired or it clicks with you about, okay, that's how I can do that. That's how I can bring something new or something fresh to my congregation that I've been looking for. Or maybe you haven't been looking for, but somewhere down the road, you might hit the rut and look back and think, huh, I remember what they said. I can implement that with my fellow congregation. So we are glad that you're here with us tonight, and we hope that you uh, and, uh, find and enjoy uh, some inspiration and some help this evening as well. So that brings us to the meat and potatoes of our talk this evening. Uh, earlier, just a few moments ago, Pastor John was talking about preparing worship as if we're preparing dinner or supper or a meal for our congregation. 
And that's kind of a really good way to, uh, to put it. You know, we have our steak, we have our meat, we have our potatoes, and we have all that. And we bring it together in one dish and we serve it to everybody. <clears throat> but sometimes uh, you need a new recipe in your kitchen. You know, we all have those recipes that we, we have in our head. We know how to measure. We know how much spice, how much flour, how much oil goes into the pot. We don't need to look at the recipe because it's all up here in, in our heart. But, you know, sometimes we're going to maybe pull a new recipe off the shelf or from inside the, the box where we keep them. And we're a little hesitant on how to, how to properly prepare this dish. And hopefully tonight, Pastor John and I will be able to help you with that. You know, some congregation people, they might be hungry for hot wings, something spicy, or there's more people like me who don't like to eat barbecue potato chips because they think those are spicy. Everybody's taste is going to be different, and we hope that we uh, find something that uh, is flavorful for you tonight. Now, Cajun rice, you know, is going to be a little different than Asian rice, right? Bluegrass music tastes a little different than our contemporary music that some people may listen to. Prayers from our heart are going to be a lot different than the prayers that are printed in our liturgy. The comparisons are endless, but infusing arts into your weekly service provides more points of view, allows for more outlets, not only for you as a worship leader, but also for your congregation and the people sitting in the pews. You'll hear hopefully a lot of examples or a lot of ideas uh, that we at our church have done and maybe uh, some line up with uh, things that you guys have tried. Um, but just take my word for it. There's a lot of ways to prepare worship. And there's also a lot of ways to prepare shrimp, just like our friend Baba. Anyway, like I was saying, shrimp is the fruit of the sea. You can barbecue it, bake it, saute it. There's um, shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole, shrimp gumbo, pan fried, deep fried, stir fried. There's pineapple shrimp, lemon shrimp, coconut shrimp, pepper shrimp, cave shrimp, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger, cave shrimp. That's that's about it. So as you could see or read on the screen, there's a lot of different ways to prepare shrimp. But we're not here tonight to tell you how to prepare your shrimp exactly, if that makes sense. We're here to help you find some inspiration. And we've done that through uh, putting together five steps that you should be able to go through. If you're wanting to incorporate something into your worship service, if you're wanting to make a more artful worship experience, and to kick us off with our five steps, we're going to turn it back over to Pastor John. So here they are, they're in front of you. Again, think of the idea of worship is providing a meal. So the meal includes the time of the music selected, the prayers, how they're offered, the word of the Lord, how it's read, the sermon that is delivered, the announcements that are given. There's all those aspects, just like a meal that you would lay out at a table at your kitchen to eat and enjoy. So here's the steps we would suggest. You inform your team. Make sure they're on board with whatever you're about to try. Number two, share a new spice with the dish that you'd like to offer. For example, say you're gonna spice up the prayers for the next six weeks. You've informed your, your team about those kinds of things and that's what you're gonna emphasize. You prepare that feature, you serve up the meal and then you listen to the reactions. And that's basically what it happens. So this is how we approach worship often here, and especially in my journey. Make sure you're all on the same page. So that's talking to those sous chefs, and you're crying, maybe scratching your head and saying, sous chefs, who's, what do you mean, what do you mean? Well, your music director, your Sunday school teacher superintendent, your 
um, leader of the Stefan ministry. People that are involved in the direct aspect of worship, make sure that they're all on board so that everybody's reading from the same page of the recipe book. My big group that I always open things with is the board of elders. So the elders know what's coming down the pike and have a chance to speak about it and share about ideas that they think or like in advance of it happening. So for example, let me just share with you very briefly. For 2020, our um, themes for the year were already set last year at 2019. Not all the orders of service, but the themes for the season of the church year. So I look at it as little chunks. This part of the area, this is what we're going to concentrate on. Here's the theme that we're going to do for Advent. Here's the theme we're going to do for Epiphany. This past year, 2021, our Epiphany theme was a thousand points of light. Everything had to do and revolved around light. And yes, I gave George Bush credit for that. Second one, for our Lenten season, that had been set at the beginning or actually at the end of 2020. And it was going to be um, our, walk to the, uh, our walk to the cross, the um, Easter experience. And is our post Easter theme ready? Yes, that's already in the, in the, on the docket, so to speak as well. If you keep people informed, then you're, they're more receptive to what's going to be served. You know, and use the bulletin in other ways to communicate that with the church family. The second one is share a new spice. So for example, if you're gonna provide some jazzy kinds of sounds in worship, let those who are in part of the, part of the music department prepare in advance, well in advance for those kinds of sounds to happen. And if the elders know that they're coming in advance as well, and the congregation too, it makes it more receptive. I always try to be playful yet respectful in how I present and lead worship. At the same time, you don't want the spices or the new change to overpower the meal because really it's more about God and not about us. So you need to also know your audience. If you live in a conservative area, maybe that's not the time to try something too outlandish too quickly. If you live in a really um, open-minded community, you might want to slowly eke in some of those more traditional songs. It goes both ways, how you prepare the meal and how you offer it up. These rules apply for worship all the time. Planning is the key. The better planned you are, I find, the better easier, the easier it is for everyone to accept what's being offered as the meal. Now, in our own church family, we've done musicals. We've even done a ballet, but people knew in advance that the ballet was coming. They'd never had, you're having dancers? You're bringing dancers into our sanctuary? We've never had dancers in our sanctuary. Nobody has dance. And then you do some education and you tie it in and you say, brothers and sisters, there's members in the Moravian church throughout the world that have dance very much a part of their worship experience. Well, not here in Dover, Ohio, they don't do that. Well, they're about to one particular week. And then later on, it happened again in another way, in another capacity. These are really important features, I believe, because then once you prepare the feature together, everybody's on board. There's some enthusiasm that grows with it. The team starts to talk about it. People start jabbering and saying, hey, do you hear this is coming? You know, they're going to try this. Oh my gosh, I hope they don't do that thing that they did two years ago. Oh my gosh, they're going to do it again. And then you discover sometimes tastes are acquired. The more they get used to it, the more comfortable they become with that new flavor, that new taste in the lines of worship. 
Remember our goal here is we prepare a meal and we offer it to those who are at the table, this beautiful supper that we give. You sometimes wonder which one of those characters are part of your congregation. There they are. What did they expect? They expected the Passover and they had prepared for the Passover and the Passover was ready for the disciples. And Jesus turned the tables and suddenly he became the lamb and he became the sacrifice. Some of them might have gotten it and others may have missed the mark. These are the things that we try to do at the church. I'm gonna send it back to Joe for the last little piece that we wanna take a look at. So step five in our process is probably one of the most important parts of this whole process and it's listening and learning from your congregation or your elders. The job of a worship leader isn't to force feed your congregation. Now you can prepare a, uh, a service that might be like that, but if they don't care for that type of preaching, they're gonna let you know. Instead, as a, uh, as a preacher or worship leader, uh, be more open-minded and playful, especially if you're gonna be incorporating more interactive or, art, or <clears throat> artful experiences in your worship service. Now, some people might think it's unusual or unhealthy to add something artistic or unique to a worship service each week, as if you're not taking this very seriously. But in my opinion, I think you are taking it seriously. You're just trying to find new ways to bring your congregation into the worship experience to open their mind or to get them to focus on something else, which can be very healthy in some um, circumstances. Now, most, excuse me. Now, like most things, not everything you try is gonna be super success, successful the first time you try it. Uh, but this is all part of the process, and it's all very important to try, especially if it's gonna be newer to your congregation. Uh, one of my hobbies that I like to do, I'm not very much of a sports person. I'm very uh, theatrical and I love following Broadway and the news and all that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, the past year, there hasn't been much to follow. Uh, but as an example for this is a lot of uh, Broadway shows, they go through this process called previews, where for about a month before they open the show, they present the show at night as a, for an audience as if they're doing the show. But during the day, they practice and they change, they, they edit songs, they take away songs, they add songs, they cut things, they change things based on the audience's reaction so that they can make a better show when they officially open. Now, this is all kind of like uh, what you're going to experience with your congregation. You're gonna try something. Maybe you try a more fast paced contemporary song if you're used to you know the more traditional blue hymnal kind of thing and as you hear them sing it you go oh they're really enjoying this maybe we'll try this again next week or sometime in the future or you know the music's playing everything's you know the, the energy from the speakers is is good but the audience is not really singing they're, they're not really catching on so maybe you make that change the next time it's all important how you listen both with your ears but also with your heart are you feeling that your congregation is getting what they need if you prepare a drama based on the scripture lesson for the week are they getting it or would they just or would they have been better just hearing it traditionally read to them you have to kind of push and pull your congregation because everybody's congregation is a little bit different now, um, the most important part of this is the listening. Um, listening not only to the congregation, but also, like we mentioned, the elders or the other people who are in charge of preparing the worship service each week. They're going to have a lot to say as well, especially if this is all new to them. 
listen to them, listen to any ideas that they might bring and adjust accordingly. We want to make sure that everybody feels heard, that it's not just you, the pastor or the lay preacher, whoever um, is in charge. Not that it's just not your show, right? It's everybody's show. It's everybody's nurturing that they need each week. Now, another thing that you can do with the arts is kind of using them to portray and present difficult things. You know, there's always sometimes uh, difficult announcements or even a difficult uh, scripture lesson that's kind of you're like, oh, that's kind of all right, here we go. I have to say it. I don't want to say it, but that's kind of what we have to do this week. And you can use art to kind of soften the blow of that particular scripture lesson or the announcement or whatever. You can kind of use it, for lack of a better uh, term, as a distraction or something, you know, present the hard to hear material. And then afterwards, present a lighthearted, fun song or uh, a, a funny, uh, telling of, of the Bible story or something, something to lighten the mood. Um, because not everybody likes to hear the hard things. Now, uh, kind of bringing in my Disney experience that I had, I worked for them almost a year ago. Um, unfortunately, because of coronavirus, uh, my, my life plat or life kind of changed and brought me back home. But one of the things I did there was I worked uh, at a ride. And uh, one of the positions that they uh, had us work was called unload, right? And as people got off the ride, we had to do this thing called spieling, where we said this phrase over and over again, please stay seated, please keep your seatbelt buckled, and we will let you know when it's safe to exit. We had to say that over and over and over again, about every 30 seconds for like 45 minutes to an hour straight. And it became very taxing and very, you know, by the end of it, I needed to drink a water and felt like I needed to not talk for the rest of the night. But in order to keep that going, you change how I presented it, right? I would maybe present it in a more open way, adding hand gestures or doing it in a funny voice or something just to keep it fresh for me, but also my congregation, the people in the ride um, kept them entertained as well. And we can kind of use the same strategy for our worship services, right? Sometimes we feel as if the, the Bible verse this week is, oh, I've already done that one before. I don't want to do it again. Or how can I make that, you know, whatever. Your number one goal is to glorify and worship God. So as long as you keep that in mind and you change it up a little bit, you should be okay. Giving and preparing worship each week can feel repetitive, right? As if the week before was the same as uh, the week before is the same as this coming week. How do I get out of that rut? Well, by bringing some sort of artistic or unique aspect to your worship service can help you get out of that rut. Now, what I'd like to share uh, with you all at this time are some of the things that our congregation at Dover First Moravian has been fortunate to uh, provide our congregation over the past, I don't know, I've been here 24 years, so uh, I'd say over those, uh, over that time, and I've broken, broken them up into three sections. The first one I'd like to share with you is the music. Now, you might be able to uh, do some of these as well. Have a variety of things for your congregation to hear. We are very fortunate in our congregation to have a bell choir. And about three or four times a year, they come out and they play songs. You know, it changes it up from our organ music or our choir music. We used to have a children's choir. We still do in some facet um, that brings the youth involved. So if you have anything like that, uh, maybe uh, have them get involved or be a part of that. Or something simple, like just using recordings of choirs from other countries or other congregations to kind of bring in a new... Uh, music uh, style just to open up to your congregation. Um, we are very fortunate to have a very active uh, choir at our congregation, and they sing, you know, the traditional music, the hymns we all know and love, but um, they also uh, have a very gifted music director, and we're very blessed to have him, who brings in 
other varieties of music for uh, not only the choir to sing and grow from, but also for our congregation to hear. And another neat thing that might be a little bit of uh, outreach for you, your congregation if you'd like to try is reaching out to your local musicians or even musicians in your own congregation. Have them come in and share their gifts for uh, the service or even local school groups. Have them come in and share um, in the prelude or the postlude or special music. Um, we found those to be very successful and very unique experiences that our congregation has enjoyed. Now we also use visual art. Things that we have done and might be easy for you to incorporate is have an artist uh, paint a picture during the service or during the sermon. You know, maybe ahead of time, give them the scripture lesson and then have them think about it and paint what's inspired by them. And the congregation can watch that take shape as the service unfolds. Or if you're kind of into planning ahead, you can do a sermon series based off of works of art, art that already exists, or maybe have people in your congregation or community commission art and use them as examples or a, a visual for your preaching sermon that week. A neat uh, activity that our congregation does as outreach to our community is called the Chalk Walk. We're excited to celebrate the 10th anniversary of that event this year. And what we do is we have fifth graders from our local school come and down the main street of our town, they draw chalk art on the uh, sidewalks in front of the local businesses and stores. And we have um, the community come out and they get to see all the beautiful art. And uh, we do that in the fall, in the fall time. And it gets the local businesses and libraries and schools involved. Uh, something more within our own church are, we call them kid kits. We've been doing them through the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. And basically uh, they're gallon plastic bags that we fill with materials and that kids can take home and do small art projects based on the scripture for that week or a Bible story. And that's something that they can work on at home with their family and use and keep on their shelf when they're done. And then other elements that we use to help illustrate confirmation class work on art projects or they use old church bulletin covers to make a collage or they take a cross and they paint it and they use that as an illustration for their lessons as well. And then finally, my favorite is drama. Um, I'm sure we've all been a part of or have seen Christmas pageants. Um, these are all very cool and neat things to do. You know, you can base them off of the scripture and read them straight out of the Bible. Or uh, like our congregation, we got had to get a little creative this year and we took ours virtual and we called it the Prophecy Promenade. And basically we took the nativity story and broke it up into a uh, kind of a news anchor interview style. And we brought people into the church and did distancing and COVID safe procedures. And we filmed them one at a time. And uh, as the characters and Mary did a, Mary did a segment, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, did a segment, and then the uh, one of the wise men talked, and then a shepherd talked, and they all gave their experience, and so we got creative in that uh, way to kind of mix it up for the Christmas time. Scripture lessons, uh, lesson skits. Um, if you have experience with VBS, that's a good place to start to kind of look on how to how to model those scripts uh, if you're into writing them or maybe find some free examples on the internet uh, for the Bible that way. It's a good way to illustrate and kind of bring the story to life. Or maybe just some quick camp skits just to change the pace of worship, just to, you know, have something fun here and there. Or um, maybe if you have the means to show filmed bits of a movie or something in your worship service that might help illustrate that. Um, basic readings of the uh, scripture. Basically, what we've done before is uh, reading the scripture lesson. We don't change a word of it, but the person reading the scripture is dressed up as the character from the Bible, and it just kind of gives another bit of context or a little bit more uh, in-depth look th into how that scripture came to be or whose eyes uh, that scripture is coming from. And then as Pastor John mentioned before, we've done whole productions before. We've done musicals about Elijah, the prophet, and uh, also about um, Irene, the ship, the missionary experience for some of our early Moravian uh, people back in the day. Now, those take a lot of time and effort, but um, it's a good way to bring your whole congregation together, children, the music, 
artistic people and um, things like that. So those are some of the examples that our congregation have done over the years. And maybe those uh, might inspire you to maybe try something with your own congregation through music, visual art, or even just drama. All right. And so now I'll turn it back over to Pastor John to kind of bring us in and tie it all together. Once again, these are the five steps that we tend to use around here um, as we prepare these meals for the life of the congregation. Keep in mind, all of this is an opportunity for you to make a difference in, in their lives and in celebrating with, with God and community. The drawback always is, is sometimes, you know, things will fly and sometimes they will flop. And it's okay to have those, those flops. It shows our authenticity. It shows our humanness. And, you know, again, it's not about us. It's supposed to be more about God. That's who we're celebrating and spending time with. We would love to open it up to any questions and answer questions you might have, and we might have a few answers. I do have a question. Sorry, just didn't want to talk at the same time as anyone. Um, do you have any specific yeah, suggestions you know, for how? to gather that feedback, um, you know, I'm hearing sorry, from the congregation, we, what they... We didn't hear your entire question. So can you uh, start over oh, for us? I'm so sorry. sorry. No, you're fine. Yep, sorry. yep, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering if you have any specific suggestions for how to gather that feedback. Are there ways that you found that work better than others to get um, members and, and elders, um, you know, just their true feelings about something that's new? Well, good. Well, for me, Caroline, what I've done in the past is, so on a, on a, with the Board of Elders, they see a section that's called Worship and Worship Reflections. And so we will look at what, what is coming for menus, if you will, what's coming down the pike, what we're preparing for, but then I would like this past week when we had the Board of Elders, I said, so let's reflect on what we thought of Epiphany. How do you think that went? What do you think was well received? What should we have tweaked? What can we learn from those experiences? That's a very you know, polite and wonderful way of handling it. The other way is you just simply listen to people and you listen to what they're not saying. And you know, as a pastor, I can remember Many, many times I've done some really, what I thought were really creative things. But see, if you get a little too gimmicky or you get a little too weird or a little too out there, you will discover, people will tell you that I don't want you to ever to do that again. Um, I had one, let me just, a very brief one. When we celebrated our 175th anniversary, this takes back, you'll have to, cue this in your mind. I did a Jonathan Winters piece. I took seven different kinds of hats from seven different genres and generations over that span of 175 years. And I became the character that was different with a different voice for every single one. People just loved it, except for this one gentleman who looked me right after church. I mean, he didn't, he loaded up and unloaded. He was not waiting. He said, young man, if I want to go to the theater, I will buy a ticket and I will go to the theater. I do not want to see anything like that ever happen in this church and congregation again. You are not a drama, something, something. And he was just, it was like, this is what I think about that. That wasn't church. That was, and then again, you gotta, you, you kind of 
brush it off or, you know, shake it off and, and you move on and you keep trying. Other questions? Don't let that scare you by any means. I mean, there's always gonna be those, you know, the, the two curmudgeons. Every church has a curmudgeon or two, but they might have been curmudgeons to the pastor before and the pastor before that. And that's just how it is. Any other questions? Do have any of you here have experience trying something new or um, trying to slide in something a little more artful? I mean, everybody is uh, artful and in some respect, but has anybody ever tried anything or seen anything that maybe they'd like to share that we didn't talk about or might have any good ideas? I can share something that I used to do with senior high when I was a senior high leader. Um, I would do a vision board with them. And so I would have lots and lots of magazines and old daily text and even just things that I had typed verses that I had typed up or whatnot. And it would be all over the table. And I don't know if anyone had experience with vision boards, but, um, and then I would also have, you know, glue obviously and scissors and, and um, markers and crayons and stuff like that. Just a huge, we, we had a, a pool table in our senior high room. And so over the pool table with all this stuff. And I would um, lead them on um, discerning questions. Like, you know, well, first, of, you know, I would, as they were, and I would tell them not to talk, just to listen and to listen to their heart and to try and hear God's voice as, as they were just looking through these images and ripping, I really encourage them to rip and not cut, just like go with your gut and rip and, and, you know, like leading questions, like what is God calling you to do? Or, you know, what are your gifts that God wants you to share? You know, it could be any number of questions and it would usually, we would be able to do it during a senior high Sunday morning. And at the end, once they have put everything together and, you know, they get really into it so you have to say okay we only have 15 more minutes we only have five more minutes and then they would um actually you would invite them to share well look at this and and i think i might have done a partner first like what does the partner see and then and then anyway at, at the end they would reveal well i think that you know why did i choose this and and it's very subconscious until they really put it all together and then Honestly, it, it is very, it can be very revealing. I also did this um, same exercise with people who wanted to go on mission trips, you know, and, and, you know, where, where does, is this really God talking to you or do you want to do this? Um, you know, what is this? It was a, a discernment. I mean, where, where is God leading you and how is he leading you to use your, your skill? So that was one thing that I did. And the other thing that I did um, was at our local camp, our Moravian camp here in North Carolina. We actually had a whole week long art camp, but um, one of the things that I did was I partnered with um, uh, a Methodist pastor's wife and she had developed this um, program called Praying in Color. And it's a book, you can buy it from, um, what is that, Paraclete Press paraclete press um and she gave us permission to utilize it in our camp and um and just in other ways and so basically the praying in color is you you like create a shape and that shape is you know how you would call god and then you your next shape is what you're asking from god and then your next shape is who you're asking that for you know i mean it can be all kinds of way but you're praying as you're like it's almost like zen tangling and because i'm a visual artist i don't know if you picked that up yet <laughs> but um and that was very um lovely for many groups and we actually even did a fundraiser where people paid to come to the workshop you know i got permission from the lady to do that and um it was like a fundraiser so that was an, a way to connect like people from other churches so that was that was fun yeah so anyway those are the things i've done <laughs> So um, I've done um, 
uh, for Earth Day the one year, I did, um, we have tables in the back of our space because our space also doubles as our adult day center. And so I laid um, paper across all the tables, had everybody go back and find a spot. And at each table I had modeling clay, I had pens, I had markers, I had um, uh, crayons, I had um, construction paper. And um, I did, um, almost like a combination of, of um, Electio Divina where I took a passage that I read three times and the first time I just had them listen and then the second time I had them pick out a part of it that jumped out and I um, read parts pieces from the Psalms that have a lot of, of um, uh, visual imagery of creation and then the third time I read it um, I had them gave them each five minutes to use whatever art supplies they wanted to use to create what they heard. Um, and that was really well received. Um, I also did a day where we did prayer stations where we, um, oh, um, we did a day with prayer stations. And so one day we had, a uh, or we had a, a spot where there were um, colorful uh, cloths across the table with candles on top. There was one space where we had a world map and a national map and we had little stones and it was put uh, the stones where you know people that you're praying for. Um, another station where um, the, there was like a written prompt and people were supposed to, to write um, for five minutes at, um, stream of consciousness thoughts. Um, so we've done stuff like that. Um, we have one person in our congregation that just loves to dance. And so she has a couple times taken songs that she has choreographed and, and will uh, dance to uh, when it fits with our, our message or, or our theme. And um, one of the things is I, this congregation here is with the exception of one person who John sounded like the person that you said, if I wanted to go to the theater, I would have bought a ticket. Um, with the exception of one person who hates everything that we do that's not traditional, the rest of this congregation fully embraces trying new things. And I love it. They're, they just, they, they eat it all up because they just, yeah, they really, they appreciate it. But I have one who it doesn't matter what it is, if it's outside the box, I will get a phone call or an email that tells me how horrible it was. We went three weeks without singing a Moravian hymn. And I got told Pastor John, you need to unmute. All right. And then did Isaac, Isaac, did you have a question? No, I'm just wanting to share too that I have, I had actually introduced some things and um, they were well received. I introduced the liturgical dance and uh, I have persons asking, when will that be done again? I had our young people, instead of just reading the gospel story, they acted it out. That was also well received. One of the things that I did one, one Easter Holy, Holy Week is to set up a garden of Gethsemane in the sanctuary. And uh, it was actually called uh, a prayer, meet with God, a time of prayer. And my God, even to today, persons from that congregation talks about it because of the effect it had. So yes, um, persons will embrace different ideas from time to time. But as Mandy said earlier, uh, there'll always be one to critique it in a negative sense. Y yes, I, I wanted to say something. I'm calling from the Virgin Islands, um, Van Keys Isaac. Before the storms of 2017 at Emmaus Moravian, our young people led worship every fourth Sunday and they would dance and dramatize the gospel reading for that Sunday. Very cool, very neat. Uh, well, thank you all for sharing. We're gonna bring it real uh, back and give us just a real quick closing and we'll get you all sent home for the evening.
Okay, well, what am I doing here? Close. Okay. So Aaron Burr in the musical Hamilton said to Alexander Hamilton, talk less, smile more. Maybe we should smile more and give our best in worship to the Lord. Each and every Sunday, we have that opportunity to freshen the table. And if you will, give a meal that is worth it's worth its taste in joy. So I share this final little silliness with you as we take a look at Julia Child. Or not. <laughs> Miss Broiler, Miss, Miss Roaster, Miss Capernet, Miss Stewart, and old Madam Hen. But we're spotlighting Miss Roaster of the Year, measuring in at 14, 15, 14. We're roasting Miss Chicken today on the French Chef. <laughs> So I close with this final thought. Sisters and brothers, don't be a chicken in trying something new with the flock. They might peck a little at you, but in the end, it'll be far worth because you know why you're doing it. You're giving glory to God and celebrating fellowship with one another. Just like Enoch, you're sliding up beside the Lord and walking with him for that next part of the journey. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this chance. Godspeed to you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.